Representative Salazar, I welcome your testimony. There. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you, Chairman Cole and Ranking Member McGovern and members of the committee. And I'm here to urge support of House Resolution 1117 and to urge the Rules Committee to grant a closed rule for the resolution. Six months ago, Hamas unleashed pure, unadulterated hatred with their massive, brutal assault on Israel. Terrorists butchered over 1,200 innocent Israeli men and women and children and at least 31 American citizens. The accounts of Hamas atrocities haunt our nightmares. The cruelty knew no end from burning alive entire families, forcing children to watch their parents be murdered, to rape and torture. And the nightmare continues. Right now, 130 hostages, including Americans, remain trapped and subject to unthinkable conditions. In response to these unthinkable atrocities, the United States Congress united, God for that, Republicans and Democrats, students supportive of our most important ally in the Middle East, Israel. Congress shown a bipartisan light recognizing the horrors of what these terrorists are continuing to inflict on innocent people. On October 25th, we voted overwhelmingly to pass a resolution stating that the House of Representatives, us, stands with Israel as it defends itself against the barbaric war launched by Hamas. We also said that the House, us, stands ready to assist Israel with emergency resupply and other security, diplomatic, and intelligence support. But in the last six months, many in this country and around the world have lost moral clarity. For the last 16 years, Hamas has embedded itself and its terrorist infrastructure amongst civilians in Gaza. We know that they have built tunnels under schools, hide weapons in hospitals, and turned water pipes into missiles. For that reason, the humanitarian toll from this war is immense. But one thing is clear, Hamas started this war and has no intention of ending it, and the White House just said it right now. There was a ceasefire on October 6th, Hamas broke it. Efforts to release hostages, Hamas is obstructing negotiations. For these reasons, I'm deeply concerned by the Biden administration's decision to publicly pressure Israel to stop its military operations in Gaza without demanding the release of hostages or other concessions by Hamas. On March 25th, for the first time during the conflict, the United States allowed a United Nations Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire to pass. On April 4th, a summary of President Biden's call with Prime Minister Netanyahu stated that our president underscored that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and protect innocent civilians. Neither the United Nations resolution nor President Biden's phone call demanded a release of hostages, at least in exchange for a ceasefire. Nothing. Nothing was asked in exchange. That is why I author this resolution stating that we stand with Israel as it defends itself against Hamas' barbaric war and reaffirming Israel's right to self-defense. My resolution opposes effort to place one-sided pressure on the state of Israel regarding this conflict. Israel did not start the war. This war was not chosen by Israel. We need to support our ally Israel as it fights to restore its security, not empower the terrorists. Again, thank you, and I urge support of House Resolution 1117, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Meeks, I welcome your testimony. Thank you. I'm here to speak in opposition to this uh, partisan resolution, which really has nothing to do to help release the hostages, help the state of Israel, or the Palestinian people. It's a cynical and misleading and in my estimation, is really just a stunt meant to gaslight every American. The resolution states that, and I quote, opposes efforts to place one-sided pressure on Israel with respect to Gaza 
including calls for an immediate ceasefire, such as the recent statement by President Biden and the United National Security Council, Resolution 2728, which was adopted due to the Biden administration's decision not to exercise the United States veto. Let me tell you something. This is why this is disingenuous and misleading. Firstly, the administration's position on a ceasefire has not changed. President Biden is seeking a temporary ceasefire combined with a release of the hostages. Now, do you know who else supports this policy, who I've heard say the same thing? Actually, Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government, who, as we speak, are actively engaged in negotiations to achieve this goal. Secondly, there was good reason for the administration to abstain instead of vetoing the UN Security Council resolution mentioned in, the res in this resolution. Why? Because this resolution came after weeks of negotiations at the UN, during which we did in fact use our veto to dismiss some other outlandish resolutions. This resolution demonstrated a remarkable progress in getting the parties to move closer to our position. The resolution, the resolution that we abstained from reaffirmed the United States position that a ceasefire of any duration come as part of an agreement to release hostages in Gaza. This is a good thing which the United States and the Israeli government support. This was not a part of any previous resolutions. Secondly, the resolution thanked the governments, including Israel, who are part of the negotiations to free the hostages. Was it part? of others. And third, and the reason why the resolution fell short was because it did not contain language condemning Hamas, something that the United States representative specifically called out because it wasn't included therein, further reinforcing why the United States ultimately abstained despite making significant progress on the overall resolution. You know, there is a careful dance of diplomacy being conducted at the UN, one that requires understanding of the context and the process. This resolution that's before us provides no context at all. And when it comes to the process, there, is, there wasn't one. There was no regular order for this resolution. The Foreign Affairs Committee never marked up this resolution. No one knew this was coming to the floor until the last possible moment on Friday afternoon. And indeed, this is the first time ever in my role as the ranking member or the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee that we are moving legislation that needs to pass through the Rules Committee without any markup in the Foreign Affairs Committee. Not one, nothing. This is another sad precedent set by this majority and may well be one you come to rule. It is rich that my friends on the other side of the aisle are playing this game of charades while they continue to reject emergency supplemental funding for Israel. My friends on the House Republican side have had the opportunity to pass the bipartisan Senate bill for weeks while they sit on their hands and seem to be appeasing their dear leader, Donald Trump, and it's to Israel's detriment and to the detriment of our own national security. This resolution is wrong, misleading, and a distraction from the real work that needs to be done to free the hostages, help our ally Israel, and meet the humanitarian needs of the Palestinian people. What Israel needs is bipartisan support in the United States to meet its many challenges. 
Republican leadership is actively damaging the U.S.-Israel relationship with this partisan game. We should not be playing games while so many lives are on the line. This resolution should not come to the floor, and instead we should move ahead with the productive initiatives that actually help the people of this country and our friends around the world. And I should say this also, without hoping no one gets after him. Chairman Michael McCall and I worked very hard and closely together. And we had this scenario where we try to do things in a bipartisan way because it affects us all. Our country's natural defense, it affects us all. This is not should be a partisan political issue. We try to work together, unlike some other committees. That's why it was very important where we work collectively after the attacks on October the 7th to come up with a resolution that was bipartisan and that virtually every member could sign on to. We worked, it didn't just happen. We sat down, we worked, we talked, and we tried to make sure because we wanted one message to come out of Congress. The message that we were united. This resolution, the intent is to try to come out that we're divided. And in my 26 years, hearing a member of the United States House of Representatives, these are the issues where we come united. There's no way that we've ever had a resolution like this that did not go through the committee and allow the chair and the ranking member to work it out to see if we could come up with something that we could all agree upon. Not play politics. It's too serious and too important an issue to play politics on this. So I'd say we should not be moving forward with this. We should allow the committee to work its will. Give the chairman and myself an opportunity to talk together. Let's, as we do on a regular basis, and let's figure out how we can make sure that we do something that is real, that will save lives, that will make sure that the people of Israel are safe, that make sure that the people in Gaza gets the kind of humanitarian aid that they need and we're opening up those doors so we don't have starvation so that we can show that we have the same values. And yes, to make sure that we go after in a way that is not destroying all life, but yes, holding Hamas accountable for the atrocious acts that it committed on October the 7th. I think that we should be able to find that and do that collectively, not in the way that this manner, this resolution is uh, being put forward. With that, I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Chair, thanks, both of our witnesses. Representative Salazar, just give you an opportunity to respond to anything that uh, <coughs> Mr. Meeks has just alleged. Uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity, um, Honorable Member. And uh, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to be next to uh, Chairman and uh, Honorable Chairman Meeks. Uh, the only situation with this resolution is that time is of the essence. Um, we were during, the, not in session, when the conversation between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu occurred. So I think it's of utmost importance for us as members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, to send a message to the world that the United States Congress, along with the White House, is with Israel. That's why we need to move forward need to move fast and send a very clear message that Democrats and Republicans, we are with Israel. And that is not of our, it's not, it's not a, a good idea for our, from coming from our White House to send the message to the world that we are imposing on a foreign leader like Mr. Netanyahu, who is under war right now, that he needs to call for a ceasefire and that he has to stop the war right now unilaterally. That's the only reason why we're doing this, and we're doing it so quickly, because this time is of the essence, and we need to send a clear message, Democrats and Republicans, that we are with Israel. So I <clears throat> certainly uh, underscore that time is of the essence, and I mean, I, you all sit on the com com Committee of Jurisdiction, I don't, so I'm not um, given the same 
depth of briefings that you all are, but it, I mean, this morning there was a report that yet another hostage had possibly perished in, while waiting for some resolution of this. I mean, this, this needs to happen. Well, right now the White House just says that Hamas position of the new truce is not encouraging. That's coming from the White House. And basically what this resolution does is three things. Reaffirms Israel's right to defend itself, which I think we all agree. Number two, reaffirms the United States commitment to Israel, which we all agree, and opposes President Biden placing one-sided pressure on Israel to call for a ceasefire. Hey, the war could stop tomorrow if both sides come, and if Hamas comes to the table in a uh, legal fashion with the true intention of stopping what's happening. Uh, it's, not in, it's not Israel's timetable, it's Hamas's. Well, thank you both for being here. Um, Mr. McGovern. Wow. Um, anyway, uh, I'm listening to this. Uh, you're on the Foreign Affairs Committee. You introduced this resolution, and you just said that the reason why regular order wasn't followed was because time is of the essence. Uh, and they're so vitally important to get this bill to the floor, a non-binding resolution, a, basically another press release. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't have the force of law. Doesn't, have, doesn't do anything at all. Uh, that there was no time for, uh, like today or yesterday, for the Foreign Affairs Committee to schedule a hearing or even a markup. But this is so vitally important, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. You can give a speech, and it'll have the same effect as moving this legislation forward. Um, so, okay, now we're, you, that's your excuse for not having the Foreign Affairs Committee follow regular order. All right, what are we, now we're in the Rules Committee. And you're asking for a closed rule? So basically saying that nobody can offer an amendment, nobody will have any opportunity to make any changes. Um, you know, we could do that and debate it tomorrow. And I mean, so would you be willing to change your view and say we should open this up or that we should allow for some amendments? Or, or are you married to shutting this, the whole process down? I think that the message is very clear and that we all agree on these three so, points. So the answer the to that is no. That Israel defense no. That the answer we, is no. I guess I'm just trying. That's not my question. My question is don't whether you or not. Think that these whether, three whether or not points are I'm, very I'm, I'm, clear. No, well, my you're not. And answering, I'm sure that you agree with that. No, them. you're not answering my question. My, yeah, yeah. You know, my question is since you shut the process down totally. I mean, again, this is the most closed Congress in history. It's like Russia here when the way we're bringing legislation to the floor. Oh, I wish the yeah, Russians yeah, would yeah. look so like So I'm us. just simply saying that you, that you were saying that that you're saying that you are against anybody offering an amendment to this, which could be debated and voted on tomorrow, and this could move forward quickly. Ranking member, honorable congressman, you know that uh, in the House, things move slowly. No, and, but, and, but and, we could have, we, we have a couple of amendments. And we could be voting on this tomorrow. We could have, we could have a few amendments. I mean, uh, I, I think I that mean, the resolution stands for itself, and that it what we yeah. the three key points are exactly what the House of Representatives and, and, needs to be sending out to right. the world, specifically and, helping Israel yeah, and, and a, sending a message to our allies that we are still, as a country, yeah. backing the state of well, Israel. Well, I think everybody, I think virtually unanimously, condemned this horrific attack on Israel on October seventh. Um, I mean, it was immoral. It was terrible. We we have all called for the hostages be released. And you talk about moral clarity in your statement, but I didn't hear you say one word about the famine in Gaza, about the suffering Palestinians, uh, about the fact that we can't get food or humanitarian aid to them at scale, that World Central Kitchen workers were bombed and killed delivering food aid, notwithstanding the fact that they coordinated with the Israeli defense forces. I mean, not, not, not even a a hint of, of concern about the 33,000 people that are dead um, in Gaza. I mean, I, I'm, are you okay with all that? And I, I uh, just want to state that Democrats do not have a monopoly on compassion. We are compassionate too. There are 33,000 Palestinians yeah. that have died, 70,000 injured because of the war. Half of Gazans are experiencing extreme hunger. This is a tragedy, of course. Those kids should not be going through what they're going through. But it's also true that uh, in the last uh, few months, 468 trucks full of food have gone into Gaza. 
that we are helping and that we are treating thousands of Palestinians, I mean, I mean, the Israelis are treating thousands of Palestinians in Israeli hospitals, and that the only so you, you, force that is stopping food to get to the Palestinians are, is Hamas. Excuse me. Because there me, are excuse three me, different excuse, corridors. Excuse me. The, uh, that is incorrect. That right. is incorrect. Tell that to the, the workers at World Central Kitchen who were bombed and killed. And that was a tragedy. Right, right. But Tell you know, Israel the... did what Hamas never does. Yeah, right. It assumed responsibility, it fired the responsibles, it, uh, it, there's transparency, and they oh, yeah. assume okay. responsibility. I mean, is, so right. so it's, we, we, of course that it no. was terrible what happened. Yeah. Of course, seven yeah. people dead. Yeah. Well, no, but I, I right don't now, believe, I don't three believe, more I don't corridors believe, I don't... are open. They're North yeah. Gaza, the port, well, and Jordan. Yeah. So I... Israelis want the Palestinians to eat. Hamas is the one who's using them for there the war famine. of the images. There is a famine going on, Ms. Salazar. Half of the there is a famine are right now. Yeah, uh, right. We, we know there it. is a famine going on. People are starving to death. Hamas uh, could stop. Medical them. aid is not getting to uh, to the to the Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, water is not getting to the people of Gaza. And, who do, and, who, and, and why and, is and that I, happening? And, I, and I'm not and I'm who's not stopping here. Stopping it. Yeah, I, I am saying that that aid has been impeded by the Netanyahu government. And that is a fact. Um, well, and you could talk to- My uh, facts are that well, Hamas is the one stopping yeah. it because, you know, it's, remember that Hamas is in the business of power, not in the business of feeding the Palestinians. All right, well, this, this is, this is so, uh, anyway, we're in a whole different realm here of, 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 of reality. I mean, the, the, the bottom line, is there anything in your non-binding resolution that talks about uh, getting aid to starving Palestinians? I just, if you want, we can work on one together, but I'm, I'm, thinking, no, I'm sure that the, no, the but is there Israelis- anything in this bill? The question is anything in this bill? Basically, what the only message that we're sending here, honorable congressman, is that we would want the rest of the international so, community to understand so that, that the House no? of Representatives is not uh, agreeing with, uh, with ordering or forcing Netanyahu to do a uh, ceasefire without bringing the other so I, I, so I guess that's a no, right? There's no, nothing in here that talks about delivering humanitarian aid at scale to uh, people who are starving to death. In, we do uh, not want the Palestinians uh, to starve. But there's nothing in this bill. You know, right, the correct? Palestinians are as much as a hostage to Hamas as the Israelis yeah. are. Right, but there's nothing in this bill that talks about their suffering. Uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Meeks, uh, you know, we're here considering a simple resolution that does nothing, as, except, as you pointed out, that tries to score cheap points using the war in Gaza and the humanitarian crisis as a cudgel against President Biden. Um, uh, instead of doing this resolution, uh, can you tell us what the House could consider uh, to actually help the people of Gaza and help try to uh, ensure the security of Israel and help get the hostages released? Well, the first thing that I think that, Mr. Ranking Member, that is important is we could do this together. And we can make sure that all of those things that you talked about with reference to getting aid into Gaza to stop starvation from happening, we could sit down and figure this out. Not play politics with it, which we know will be a one-sided bill, because that's what right. it is designed to do. If it was, we wanted to really work collective together so that the world can see that we're working on one Peace. We care about Israel, its right to defend itself. Everyone has said that. We're against the horrific acts of Hamas. But as my dear colleague has said, if we are real values and humanitarian, right. that should be included in here. Well, Ms. Sellers, I just said that uh, this is time is of the essence. It's so urgent to get this non-binding resolution to the floor to vote on it that we don't have time to do regular order in the Foreign Affairs Committee, and we don't have time to even consider one amendment uh, on the House floor that comes out of the Rules Committee. I don't, I don't know what your response to that My is. My response to that is what you said. Yeah. That's like a totalitarian right, government. Yeah, right, yeah. It's not where you have an opportunity to have real dialogue and conversation to get a real result, to get compromised, to work together. You know, it's not like it's a domestic issue. The world is looking at us. And is that the message we want to send out to the world? It is the wrong thing for this body. It's the wrong thing for this country. People are dying. And there is, you know, what we need to talk to, and here's someone who's doing it on a bipartisan manner, Cindy McCain. 
Yeah, absolutely, with the World Food Program. With the World Food Program. She's right. the one that's talking about a matter of short weeks that people are right. dying right, right now and what we could do. And we could work and figure out how to collectively work together so that we don't have starvation, how to hold Hamas right. accountable, how to release the hostages. Those are things that we should be doing in a collective manner, not doing this as we have done on this committee. It's not like this committee hasn't worked together. It's not like this committee hasn't put together bipartisan resolutions and worked to try to figure this out. We didn't have to, you know, it, 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 it doesn't take a year to get that done. You have a chairman and a ranking member that are willing to work together. So there's no need to do this. And as you said, Mr. Ranking Member, if you don't want to do that, right. then at least put these amendments and let us do it, have a debate on the floor. Yeah. That would seem to me is what a democracy is really all about. Unless you don't want to hear the whole truth. Yeah. Well, I, and again, I, 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 I would never suggest that one party has the, uh, uh, you know, as a monopoly on compassion. Uh, but I would just suggest that um, it helps to mention the suffering uh, of the people of Gaza uh, to show that that compassion is real. Uh, and I am, uh, you know, we are all horrified by what is happening here. Um, and the idea that this is how we're spending our time, um, you know, uh, I think the other message to our, to the world is that we're not a serious place. This is, none of this is serious. I mean, this is all politics, and it really is, is terribly disappointing uh, and distasteful. With that, I, I yield back. General yields back, Chair. Thanks, the gentleman. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for his questions. I hate it when I find myself agreeing with something the other side said, but I, do, I don't think this is a good use of time. Um, what, what do you all think is the solution to the crisis that's going on there? And does this resolution get us any closer? I asked you first, Ms. Salazar. What's the specific question, Mr. Amendment? How do we how do we get back to peace or to a better peace? Because I don't think it was a good situation to start with. But how do we end this conflict? What what should what could we be doing to end this conflict? Well, I'm not a war expert, but I would imagine that 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 answer lies with Hamas and with Iran. Iran is the one that is directing, giving them the aid, uh, giving them the strategy, and the one who gave them uh, the go ahead to attack on October seventh. So um, I, would, I, I, I am sure that it's in Israel's best interest to do everything possible for them not to escalate the war. But uh, the Israeli government has said it, that they need to finish Hamas if there is going to be peace for them and for the Palestinians. How many, uh, well, let me ask you, Mr. Meeks, how do we get to a solution to peace, long-term peace or even just short-term? Let's talk about both. Long-term peace, we need to go back to what was taking place before with some of, our, some of the Gulf countries that's in the region, talking about normalization with Israel so that they can be able to be working side by side. We need to make sure that, and, and, and as I've talked to and my members of the committee have talked to, a number of the foreign, uh, foreign uh, ministers, uh, whether it's from Saudi Arabia, whether it's from uh, UAE who has agreed to normalization, whether it's Bahrain, who's agreed to normalization. These things were starting to happen now so that people will recognize Israel's right to exist. And Israel then looks and recognizes and have a formulation of a two-state solution where people are working side by side as what took place in the 70s when Egypt decided that there was no need to have war anymore. And in the 90s when Jordan decided there was no need to have any war anymore to try to figure out how we can live and exist together. Does, so this is a, the, the, a beginning of a long-term solution that can fundamentally change the Middle East as it has been over the last 75 years where each side is trying to fight one another. Does this resolution get us in closer? No. This resolution does what the ranking member has said, basically. But if, look, I firmly believe, firmly believe, if the chairman and I had an opportunity to sit down and try to work this thing out and try to come up with something that would be inclusive of talking about Israel's right to defend itself, of talking about the misdeeds of Hamas, but also talking about 
the Palestinians, the, the, the children, the women that have lost their lives. And I understand that 13,000 children, 9,000 women. And we were also talking about and showing how considerate we were about the children that are now dying of malnutrition. If that was inclusive of all of this, it would be something that the world could look at and say the United States collectively, not just Democrats, not just Republicans, that these are what our values are as human beings. And here's a real solution to change fundamentally what has been taking place in the Middle East. Let, let me ask you about that. Um, you know, the attack on Israel was barbaric and horrible, and there's no excuse for it. Okay. But this resolution mentions there were 1,200 people that died on October 7th, and it doesn't say anything about the ongoing casualties in this war. What, what are the casualties? Do, do you know, Ms. Salazar? I think that we should go back to the real reason why we're doing this resolution, which is basically to send a message to the international community that our government uh, should not be forcing the state of Israel, in this case his president, to get to a ceasefire or or, or look for a ceasefire without bringing Hamas to the table as well. I don't think it's, it's, in, in, it's the business of the United States to be imposing at this hour on Israel that they have to get to a one-sided ceasefire without asking anything from Hamas. Releasing the hostages, stopping the violence, that's basically all we're doing, sending a very clear message. And why the urgency? Because of what happened last week, the phone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. We but, came back today, first time of session, and that's why we, we thought that we should be sending the message, and that's why we wanted to vote on this tomorrow. I don't want to belabor the point, but the fact that it mentions casualties on one side begs what the, the question of what the casualties are on the other side. Do you know how many casualties there are? Well, I just said it. We have 33,000 Palestinians who have died and 70,000 injured. I mean, the, the casualties are going up every day, which is something okay. that is despicable on both ends. Uh, we understand that the Palestinians do not deserve what they are going through, but Hamas is their responsible. And, and I, I was... I was, I've been trying to, to, and this happens in Cuba as well, which is what, did you have this population that is hostage to people that are only offering one political view and the Palestinians do know, cannot open their eyes and see that, that they, they, their political elite is, is corrupt and barbarian. So um, everyone is the victim here of Hamas and Iran. I just have one question before I yield back. Mr. Meeks, um, do you... If this comes to the floor, do you plan to vote for or against it? Against it. Okay, thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, thanks the gentleman. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for questions. Thank you. Uh, this is the second non-binding resolution which tries to condemn President Biden using a twisted, disingenuous recitation of so-called facts. The second such resolution to come before this committee today, okay? Uh, House leadership refuses to pass assistance to Israel or humanitarian aid to Gaza, but they will waste our time, Congress's time, taxpayer dollars, trying to score sick political points and foster division and chaos here in Congress and across the country. So as we embark on the fifth hour of our hearing here today, you can understand why patients might be wearing a little bit thin, apparently on both sides of the aisle, uh, for this type of political nonsense. I, I think we've seen more than enough of it for one day, and we should move on. I yield back. Chair, thanks to the gentlelady. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I just returned from Israel, actually. And um, Representative Salazar, I, I want to thank you for your leadership in bringing this resolution forward today. And uh, can you remind us once more today which terrorist group is still holding American and Israeli hostages in Gaza? It's Hamas. 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 I, I had the, um, the honor of meeting with uh, Rachel and John Paulin. Their, their son, Hirsch, has uh, been in captivity since October 7th. And, you know, their heartbreak and their courage uh, that they have put on full display for the world, um, you know, is, is he's an American citizen. And we still have six American citizens in captivity in Gaza right now. And uh, the fact that, you know, we have an administration that 
that appears to be slowly but surely walking back their support uh, of, of our greatest ally uh, in the Middle East, our, our only democratic partner in the Middle East in Israel, um, certainly undermines that position. And, and we need to be talking in this building every single day about the fact that we have six American citizens being held still in Gaza, and we have no ability to find out from any international organization what the health and welfare of those six American citizens are. And there was a time in this country where, you know, the, it was basically the critical issue in a presidential election as the, the, the care and welfare and when the release would come of hostages being held by a foreign actor. And right now, we, you know, there, there are many um, other hostages there, uh, Israeli hostages, and, and my heart breaks, you know, for all of those families and what they have been through and the horror uh, and the tragedies that unfolded on October 7th. Uh, but uh, to, to, to hear the optimism uh, in, in, in the struggles that this family has put forward and how they won't give up uh, one iota, but they, th their hopes lie with the American people and that the administration is going to continue to keep this relationship um, sacrosanct. And, and, and we need to continue to stand with Israel every single step of the way. I think this resolution is, is an important step in that direction. Uh, and I, I really do truly appreciate uh, Representative Salazar bringing uh, this back uh, in front of us today, and hopefully we get a positive action here. So thank you very much, and I yield back. Chair, sure, thanks, the gentleman. Gentleman yields back. And is there any seeking time to question the witnesses? If not, the chair wants to thank the witnesses for being here today, and this panel is excused. Thank you. We're going to move straight into the uh, amendment panel. Uh, Mr. Klein, Mr. Biggs, and Mr. Crenshaw, if you'll join us at the front of the room. Very well. We will. Uh, we're glad you're here with us today. We will uh, go in alphabetical order. Mr. Biggs, you are recognized to speak on your amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank uh, the ranking member and uh, the members who've endured a rather lengthy hearing. And there must be some special place either in heaven for you or you did something really bad somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's good to be with you, um, and I, I'm here to talk in support of, of, of my two amendments, um, which would stop warrantless searches of U.S. person communications in the, in the FISA 702 database and also strengthen the roles of the FISC amicus curiae, consistent with reforms proposed by Senators Lee and Leahy, which passed the Senate in 2020 by a vote of 77 to 19. Appreciate Chairman Jordan for his support. Um, and also Ranking Member Nadler, Representatives Jayapal and Davidson for their co-sponsorship of these amendments. And I also thank Representatives Lee and McClintock for their work with me over the past year advocating for priorities of the Judiciary Committee. Um, as Mr. Roy was kind of iterating to you earlier about this lengthy process, um, I, I endured all of that process, and, and so um, I appreciate uh, everybody who helped us with that. Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act authorizes warrantless search surveillance, and for that reason, it can only be targeted at foreigners overseas. And yet, when the government conducts surveillance of foreign targets, it may incidentally collect Americans' communications, but that word incidental is key. If the government intended to spy on these Americans, it would have to get a court order based on a showing of probable cause either a warrant in a criminal investigation or a FISA Title I order in a foreign intelligence investigation. And despite prior efforts by Congress to protect Americans' privacy, including minimization procedures uh, and FIS court certification requirements, federal agencies with access to the 702 database 
continues to conduct routine warrantless searches of the 702 database even today for information on calls, text messages, and emails to or from Americans. In just one year, the FISA court reported that there were 278,000 violations of the government's internal rules for conducting searches, and you've been over that, but I'm just going to remind you of what a couple of those are, what a few of those are. Uh, two of our own colleagues in Congress, multiple current and former federal government officials, a state senator, a state court judge who contacted the FBI to report potential civil rights abuses, De demonstrators at Black Lives Matter protests in the summer of 2020, individuals present in D.C. on January 6, 2021, even those who weren't in the Capitol, journalists and political commentators, a local political party, victims who contacted the FBI to report a crime. They were reporting a murder of a relative. They were victims, and they were surveilled. A batch query of 19,000 donors to a congressional campaign. I could go on and on, but I just found it interesting when, when the chairman of the Intelligence Committee today said, you can't, you can't do this to American citizens. They would have to have been communicating with Hamas, is what he said. Are you mean to tell me there were 19,000 donors who were somehow contact with Hamas? It's not true. It's, it's, it's inaccurate. It's also been publicly reported that NSA agents have abused 702 to search for communications of online dating prospects, potential tenants for rental property. One, one thought his father was cheating on his mother and looked it up. Well, the underlying bill makes important changes to the program, such as increasing penalties for agents who run improper searches of the 702 database. Other changes merely codify procedures. Now I'm going to go through that in just a sec. You guys don't want to hear that, but I, 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 I got to get it on the record. The only way to ensure that Americans' rights are protected and that the abuses end is to require the government to obtain a warrant or a FISA Title I order before searching 702 data for Americans' communications. This is the right approach. It's the only reason the government obtained this information, excuse me, the only reason the government obtained this information without a warrant in the first instance is because it certified that it was targeting only foreigners and that the Americans on the other side of those communications were not the targets. If the government changes its mind and its interest shifts to the American, it should have to go back and get the warrant or FISA Title I order. The Biden administration and the intelligence community will tell you that forcing the government to get a warrant before spying on Americans will cripple 702's utility as a national security tool. They will tell you that a warrant requirement places the U.S. at an imminent risk of attack. This amendment does not take those concerns lightly, which is why it includes multiple exceptions, multiple exceptions to accommodate legitimate security needs. This includes every 702 use case cited by the government when it has publicly touted successes of the program. For instance, there's an exception for exigent circumstances where an imminent threat to life or bodily harm exists. The administration says that isn't broad enough, that they might not know at the time of the query whether there's, there's an urgent threat. But it is the same exception that's in place in every other context where the government is required to get a warrant or FISA Title I order. If it's broad enough in a situation where the government is directly investigating a suspected American terrorist, it's broad enough here. There's also an exception for consent, which will come into play mostly when the government is conducting a query for the purposes of identifying potential victims or foreign plots or so-called defensive queries. The administration has provided a small handful of examples of U.S. queries that proved to be useful in identifying victims, including cases where the FBI is trying to help companies recover ransoms and ransomware attacks or protect U.S. officials from assassination plots. It is hard to imagine, for instance, that those companies would not have granted consent. And this gets to a point Mr. Massey was making earlier, and I, wanna, uh, I won't want to make that point right now. These are not exceptions, right? But they are exceptions. They're not notifications merely. They are consent. They're going and they're getting consent. But you know who, who doesn't get that consent? Anybody who's not in Congress. You're not entitled to that consent. That is the point Mr. Massey was making. It was what makes it so insidious. Additionally, the base text of this bill includes a similar exception with a narrow universe under the base text of this bill. The F FBI must get it for members of Congress, but again, not for non-members. There's a third exception that applies to certain cybersecurity-related queries. This would enable the FBI to identify communications that contain malware and act quickly on that information. If 
Finally, our amendment would not require a court order to conduct U.S. person queries of communications metadata. In other words, things like to, from, line in an email and that the date and time the email was sent. That means the government will be able to determine without getting a court order whether and when a particular U.S. person was in contact with a foreign target. In many cases, that information combined with whatever information led the government to look at this particular U.S. person in the first place will be enough to support a probable cause order. Warrantless searches to Americans' private communications undermines both our liberty and our republic. It is contrary to our nation's values. Section 702 may be a valuable authority. I'm, I am ass I'm assured that it is for monitoring foreign threats to our nation. But you have to protect Americans' rights as well. I've offered also uh, an amendment to codify reforms to empower the Fisk and Meeke, consistent with the Lee Leahy Amendment, which passed the Senate 77 with 77 votes in 2020. The amendment substantially strengthens the role of Miki to independently analyze FBI surveillance requests that are particularly sensitive. This protection is critical because the FISA court is not adversarial, meaning that there's only a government lawyer, there's only a government lawyer there and the judge, and there's no one there to uh, protect Americans' who, interests who are under surveillance and advocate for them. So that's why this Miki amendment is so important. Uh, the amendment would authorize and actively encourage FISC judges to seek independent amicus reviews in all sensitive cases, and that's important. The amendment would also require that exculpatory information be provided to the FISA court. That is important. So uh, I want to just uh, give you two, two or three documents. Uh, one is uh, the FISA 702 reauthorization amendment. So you heard in earlier testimony the claim that um, – there was no cyber uh, spying going on, that there was not going to be anything at the, at the uh, um, coffee house. But you didn't ask it quite in the right way because the, the, it, it does. The underlying bill actually has that. And so I give you an article um, expressly stating that dated today's date, FISA 702 reauthorization amendments. The second time is not its charm. Uh, and then um, I will give you also... Um, last time uh, we were here, maybe it was not, it, maybe it, was, it was somewhere along the pike, I offered a letter uh, dated December 11th, 2023, from the U.S. Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which was created as part of the 9-11 Commission Act of 2007, Title 42 U.S.C., Section 2000. And they specifically go in and state there is not going to be uh, um, delay uh, let, let me just read from it. I strongly disagree that a requirement for FISC approval of U.S. person inquiries would amount to a de facto ban, especially assuming Congress were to provide exceptions as outlined in the question from Senator Wyden. And indeed, we have, we have put those exceptions in here. That's there. Does uh, the uh, gentleman asking them his consent to have those placed on the record? I do, please, sir. Without objection, so order. And then I want to just hash over one last thing that I think has to come out. And that is this notion that there have been 56 reforms in this, in this, uh, this bill. Part of the process was that one of the reasons that we, we uh, acquiesced in so much was because we were told that if we uh, came to together on that base bill, we would get three amendments from Judiciary Committee with the potential for, of a fourth. This included um, the, the uh, warrant amendment. Those included the Fourth Amendment's not for sale amendment, which apparently we're not going to get that, uh, and, and a couple of others uh, as well. We're not getting those. The reason we acquiesced and gave up so much in the base bill is we were told we get that. And now we're told that, that, that uh, there were 56 reforms well, I want to tell you what those reforms look like and why they're so uniquely one-sided. Of the 56 report, re reforms that re supposedly represent a middle ground between Hipsy and, and Jude, 45 of those, 80% of those, come directly from the Hipsy amendment. Eight don't come from either, I, I mean, under Hipsy bill. Eight of them don't come from either bill. Two of them came from the Judiciary Bill, which passed out 35 to 2. And one of them is consistent with both sides' language. That's, that's important. 
Um, the other thing is uh, 13 of these codify either existing practice and procedures, which are really not reforms at all, or they actually weaken existing protections. Nine of those reforms that they claim that they got are waivable by the Fisk Court. So this is really uh, uh, basically a very one-sided picture when you hear, oh, 56 of these, uh, 56 of these um, uh, reforms are, are coming out of this task force that I sat on, and I sat on all of the task forces that we've had over the last year. And I will tell you, um, judiciary has jurisdiction, primary jurisdiction. I begged that, that we, I, I requested that we get the, that uh, the judiciary bill go, and we were content to actually have an open rules debate, let the, the intel committee come in and, and fight for, and, and we all have the, that fight that I think is the push me pull you that really can actually make better legislation. But now we're, we're down here to this bill, this base bill, and we're having to beg to try to get our, our warrant amendment actually even just get debated and uh, I, we, I believe we would have passed that warrant bill, or warrant amendment, what, six weeks ago when we were here until um, something happened and we, we didn't get to go forward. I, I ask you to make these two amendments in order. Um, I'm sorry to go on so long when you, when you guys have already taken it uh, uh, a, a long day, and I didn't mean to make it too much longer, but with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you all, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, members of the Rules Committee, uh, for staying up late with us. And I uh, can't tell you how much we, we appreciate that. I want to say um, uh, quite a few words about my amendments and maybe the, the bill in general. Uh, we regularly face new threats and new enemies in the national security space, but only, only one of these threats is actually killing Americans on a daily basis. Every day, the poison trafficked into our country by Mexican drug cartels is killing Americans. In the last three years, more than 200,000 Americans have died from synthetic drug overdoses, and that's mostly from fentanyl. Fentanyl is the leading cause of death for Americans aged 18 to 45. And since 1999, the numbers of deaths have multiplied by a factor of 110. These deaths rip apart American families, they strain our communities, all while the cartels increase their profits and expand their global reach through their complex network of suppliers, producers, and distributors. That's what I want to talk about here. Because when we think of these organizations, we picture them as card-carrying, uniform-wearing Sicarios, but the reality is far more complex. Of course, there are Sicarios, there are El Chapos and his henchmen, but they're a dime a dozen. They exist to enforce the cartel's will, expand their territory, but the trafficking network is far wider, it's more compartmentalized, and it's much more like a business than it is a gang. The network starts with the precursor wholesalers, mainly in China. They ship those precursors, actually usually to the US, using international carriers. Those precursors are then picked up or delivered before being moved south to Mexico by freight carriers who take those precursors to be distributed to producers who mix the precursors to create fentanyl before it's incorporated into pill form, mixed with other drugs or just kept as pure fentanyl. They then move it north, back into the U.S. for its sale and distribution on American streets. The funds are then laundered, either through remittance or a Walla system, or by buying high-end luxury goods, like a trade-based laundering system. And throughout the whole process, white-collar enablers play a role. Lawyers, accountants, bankers. They are the ones who allow the business of killing Americans to thrive and reinvest money back into the process so the cartels can continue to grow in power. Let's not forget about China. The cartels are the ones who make and traffic fentanyl, but they cannot do so without their Chinese partners who provide the precursor chemicals and also launder their money. This means our greatest strategic competitors working with well-armed and networked groups right on our border to actively kill Americans, and we can't use FISA to gather intel on them. You might think I'm kidding about that, but I'm not kidding about that. Not even through the court system can we get a warrant to actually gather intelligence on those associates of the cartels. I am not kidding. <laughs> and that's also why I'm offering this amendment, to add counter-narcotics to the definition of foreign intelligence. Right now, as the law is written, we can only use FISA Section 702 to target foreign governments, international terrorism, or countering weapons of mass destruction. You've heard those three categories quite a bit during these, during these testimonies. 
My amendment would allow the intelligence community to also use its tools against the entirety of the narcotics trafficking organizations that are poisoning and killing U.S. citizens with impunity. Not just, not just the El Chapos, not just Ismael Zambada of the Sinaloa cartel, not just the Chapitos, not just Nemesio Cervantes of the Jalisco cartel. We can target them. We've managed to put them under the counterterrorism uh, uh, category. But everybody they deal with, we have no legal ability to even get a warrant on them. So this amendment would allow us to go after the entirety of their network from precursor supplier to shippers and carriers to producers and pill pressers to distributors because it's these networks, not the cartel leaders, who are actually making the deaths of Americans possible. I know there's opposition. I know some simply wave their hands and say, well, you're expanding FISA, so no. But that, that's an incomplete argument. What we're doing is we're updating our target sets, just as anyone would when you face a massively increased uh, threat and massively increasing deaths of Americans because of this particular problem. We're providing those new authorities because we're getting 2911s every year from this problem. I chair the, uh, the task force to combat Mexican drug cartels. I've done countless meetings, traveled quite a bit, and been shocked to hear from our intelligence community what they don't do and what they cannot legally do because counter-narcotics is simply not one of the categories that is allowed under FISA. I strongly urge uh, this, com this committee to make this amendment in order, and I strongly urge my colleagues to adopt this amendment on the floor. Thank you, and I yield back. <clears throat> Rules Committee thanks both of our witnesses for their thoughtful contributions to the, tonight's discussion. I have no additional questions. I'll yield to Mr. McGuffer. I, I thank you. Um, I thank you both for for being here, and um, and um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Mr. Biggs, you make an awful lot of sense on some of these issues that I uh, I think uh, I I shared some of your concerns, and you know I have no idea what will be made in order, but uh, uh, I, we, we we shall see. But uh, you know th this is a this is a serious issue, and it is about more than just you know. Um, well, it, 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 it's, it's about us. It's about the American people um, and uh, people's privacy. And um, but I uh, anyway. I, but I appreciate both of you being here. And um, I I know it's late, so I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Governor. I, and I should have said, Mr. Klein is on his way back. If he arrives, we will allow him to uh, talk on his amendments. But until that happens, we'll proceed with questions from members. Mr. Massey from Kentucky is recognized. Uh, but uh, I know you were here and you sat through a lot of this way with regard to fine. I appreciate your look at your amendments. I think they're thoughtfully offered and sincerely offered ways to solve problems. <clears throat> Mr. Crenshaw, you may not have been here. Uh, I think when your amendment was discussed or maybe you were in the back, but I, I don't think the, uh, the objection was really to your amendment and uh, because I know it's, it's addressing a real problem. I think the objection would be almost completely ameliorated if the base FISA program were, were handled differently. So in other words, people aren't worried about, <laughs> and in fact, I think your amendment will probably do pretty well on the floor if it's made in order. People aren't worried about the target of your amendment. They're worried about the byproduct, and it's nothing that you created or that, or that your amendment does. Um, Mr. Biggs, uh, and, I, and I'll be brief, I swear, I know I kind of filibustered earlier, and that's why you guys are here later, uh, so I'll be brief, but if, let me just ask a question of you. You have a warrant provision in there. When, you know, we're, we're being told there's nothing to worry about in the base bill, but if there's nothing to worry about, why did Congress create a carve-out for itself to be uh, number one, notified. It, you, know, the, you know, the leaders, I guess they call it the Gang of Eight, get notified. Um, if a member of Congress is going to be surveilled by the FBI, by the way, I don't, it didn't really say about NSA or CIA or anything else in there. Um, 
And then also you have to give consent if, if ostensibly the FBI is doing this for your benefit to protect you, you have to give consent. What, we probably, I doubt that members of Congress would need that or ask for that if we actually had your warrant provision in there. Uh, thanks for the question. You would not need that, Mr. Chairman. You would not need a special defensive briefing uh, if you had a warrant necessarily. Now, what I would tell you is, is what, what the Intelligence Committee Chairman, his argument is and his position is that, is that um, these are special interests and that these are subject to political bias, both, both from the, the agency, but also potentially compromising politically. So that's why they, they provide the carve out. Now, I'm not sure that persuades me, but um, my understanding is that's, that's really their position. I, and I'm not trying to articulate it, but I, that's, I mean, I, like I say, I was in there with them for a year. I'm pretty sure how that, how that goes. But, but I think a better approach would be to treat us like the American people and say, they got to have a warrant. And, um, and, or, or do what we say, include our warrant provision where we actually say, you can, you can go to somebody and seek consent, like, like on, on, on the businesses that, that they surveil. They, it's an exigent circumstance for the business. They want to get that resolved. They're going to grant consent because they want to, if, they're, if there's ransomware and they're being held hostage. I, I yield back. May, may I respond? Yield back. Uh, yes, did, did you have something you wanted to add, Mr. Crenshaw? I'll, I'll yield time before I yield back to Mr. Crenshaw. No, th th thank you. Um, well, well, certainly, I, I, I believe you're sincere in your remarks. Um, I, I was listening to the, to the conversation earlier about this particular amendment, and multiple members voiced their opposition to it as such. Um, and I hope we're not in a place where we, where, we, where we oppose things we say we support just because we don't support some of the underlying processes of, of FISA. Um, and so I think it's important to, to maybe make a few comments then about, about the, the, the real debate here, which is about warrants. Uh, on queries. And let's say counterterrorism, uh, for instance. So it's, it's easy to say that foreign intelligence should be directed at counterterrorist threats abroad. But I might remind everybody that we only care about counterterrorism abroad because of what they do here. And they can only do things here if they're talking to Americans here. And so you have to imagine certain scenarios, whether it's drug related, whether it's narcotics related, or say, you know, some, maybe something like a bunch of terrorists around the world uh, talking about a specific location in Florida where they might take flying lessons. Maybe you want to do a query on that specific location. That location would have a name, it'd be an airfield, it'd be some kind of like you know, flying instructor course. That would be under the US person's category. Now, if they're just talking about taking flying lessons, you would not have probable cause to get a warrant. But a good investigator might want to put some, put some, uh, draw some lines there and make some connections. And you might want to know if you're following one guy, you know, Muhammad, whoever, because that's the one guy you have a warrant on for FISA, you might want to know who else is also taking flying lessons there. And you would not be able to do that anymore under this new regime. You wouldn't be able to figure out how many others, um, whether they're foreigners or not, are actually taking flying lessons at that particular airfield. And you could use the same logic about drug trafficking into the US. Drug traffickers would be talking about specific locations within the United States, and they might be talking about them nonchalantly, as they would, as somebody who's tracked bad guys quite a bit. They never say openly what they're going to do. They never say openly they're going to kill a bunch of people or traffic drugs. They speak in code, um, and you know, they use some degree of operational security. And it takes good investigators to be able to actually link together what they're trying to do. And if you can't even do so much as, as query a location within the US and try, to, and try to map out who else has been talking about that specific location, who has ties to it, you're not doing your job as an investigator and you're certainly not gonna prevent the next 9-11 or even just prevent the next 10,000 deaths from fentanyl production and, and, and trafficking. It's all in the same category. And I think we're definitely misrepresenting what's happening under a query. We're calling it surveillance, but a better analogy would be to, to look at it the same way we look at wiretaps. If we have a warrant for someone's wiretap, you don't just ignore the other side of that conversation. 
You don't pretend you didn't hear it. The only difference between that and FISA is that there's a database where it's actually stored in, the other side of that conversation. I think a lot of people are under the wrong impression. I know, I know that's not what Mr. Biggs has said, and I know that's not what you have said. I think you're under the right impressions. But I think a lot of people are under the wrong impression that when we query a US person, you're getting access to their inbox. You're getting access to all their tech. And that's just not true. That's absolutely not true. You would need a warrant to do that under current law. Um, and so I realize that's, 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 that's far, that's a, that's a bit removed from my amendment. But if we're going to be opposed to my amendment because we're opposed to the base of the bill, I felt I had to speak on the base of the bill. Thank you. You're back. Thanks for that Thank clarification. You. Does, is there any objection to allowing Mr. Klein to proceed with his discussion of his amendment? <laughs> I appreciate the, it yeah, it's on. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Briefly, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I have an amendment uh, to uh, prohibit the resumption of abouts collection, which uh, mirrors language from legislation reported from the Judiciary Committee in December 2023 by an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote. Abouts collection involves the government capturing vast amounts of communication in which the selector, such as an email address, of a target appeared somewhere in communications even when the target's not a party to the communications. So currently the government's only permitted to collect communications to or from a target. Existing law, however, permits the resumption of abouts collection with notice to Congress. Uh, this has been the subject of controversy for many years. A declassified Fisk opinion from 2011 shined a light on this type of collection, uh, noting that it resulted in the collection of tens of thousands of wholly domestic communications each year by the National Security Administration. In 2017, the NSA announced it was no longer performing abouts collection. In 2018, Congress amended Title VII of FISA to prohibit abouts collection unless the AG and DNI notify the House and Senate Judiciary and Intelligence Committees that the NSA plans to resume such a collection, but this would ensure uh, that the NSA cannot resume abouts collection uh, even with notification to Congress. The government hasn't been conducting this type of surveillance for over seven years and has yet to provide Congress with any rationale for resuming it. It's a common sense amendment that will ensure the government may not resume this type of collection, which is ripe for abusive domestic surveillance. With that, I yield back. Happy to Gen answer any questions. Gentleman yields back. The, uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania has not had a chance to ask questions. I want to thank the gentleman for the brevity of his pres presentation. Um, certainly those of us who are on judiciary have heard quite a bit of discussion on the FISA issue over the last few months, so thank you all for your testimony. General Lee yields back. Any additional questions from ranking member? Any additional questions from any on the Republican side? If not, uh, committee thanks this panel, and, uh, and you are excused. Is there, is there any other member seeking to testify on H.R. 7888, H.R. 529, H.R.S. 1112, or H.R.S. 1117? Seeing none, this closes the hearing portion. Okay. Uh, chair will be in receipt of a motion from the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy. Mr. Chairman, 
I move the committee grant H.R. 7888, the Reforming Intelligence and Securing America Act, a structured rule. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides two hours of general debate equally divided among and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary or their respective designees and the chair and ranking minority member of the permanent select committee on intelligence or their respective designees. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule makes in order only those amendments printed in the rules committee report. Each amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the amendments printed in the Rules Committee report. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for the consideration of H.R. 529, the extending limits of U.S. Customs Waters Act under a closed rule. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Ways and Means now printed in the bill shall be considered as adopted, and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. The rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Ways and Means or the respective designees. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for consideration of HRES 1112, denouncing the Biden administration's immigration policies under a closed rule. The rule provides that upon adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order without intervention of any point of order to consider HRES 1112. The rule provides that the resolution shall be considered as read. The rule provides one hour of general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary or their respective designees. The rule further provides for consideration of HRES 1117, opposing efforts to place one-sided pressure on Israel with respect to Gaza under a closed rule. Ah, the rule provides that upon adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order without intervention of any point of order to consider HRES 1117. The rule provides that the resolution shall be considered as read. Finally, the rule provides one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs or their respective designees. Thank you very much. You've now heard the motion. Is there any discussion or amendment to the rule? Gentlelady's Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you. I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee strike section three of the rule, which provides for consideration of the non-binding House Resolution 1112, and insert a new section providing for consideration of H.R. 16, the American Dream and Promise Act. Mr. Chairman, instead of continuing to waste time in consideration of useless, non-binding, and partisan resolutions that don't do anything to solve immigration issues, we propose instead to bring a bill to the floor that could actually do something. H.R. 16 would provide a pathway to citizenship for DREAMers, TPS holders, and Deferred Enforcement Departure recipients. It's a good bill, and it's the right thing to do. While it won't solve Every immigration issue, it is a great step in the right direction. I believe the American people would welcome it if the House leadership would abandon the do-nothing path and let us consider real legislation. And I know that many of your colleagues on both sides of the aisle would similarly welcome such a change. I urge a yes vote on my amendment, and I yield back. Is there any further discussion of the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Yeah. No. Opinion of the chair, the no's have. Request a vote. Uh, vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Burgess votes no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rashenthaler. No. Mr. Rashenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy? No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon? Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose? Ms. Ledger Fernandez? Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Two yeas, nine nays. The noes have it. The amendment's not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Hearing no uh, requests for further amendments, the question's on the motion to report. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Yeah, roll call has roll call. been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Burgess votes aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushenthaler. Aye. Mr. Rushenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey, aye. Mr. Norman. Aye. Mr. Norman, aye. Mr. Roy. Aye. 
Mr. Roy, aye. Mrs. Houchin. Aye. Mrs. Houchin, aye. Mr. Langworthy. Aye. Mr. Langworthy, aye. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Nagoose. Ms. Leisure Fernandez. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk will report the total. Nine yeas, two nays. And the ayes have it. The motion to report is agreed to. Accordingly, Mr. Roy will be managing the rule for the majority. And Ms. Ledger Fernandez for the minority. Very good. Uh, um, I recognize my yeah, friend. Yeah, I, I, um, I would be uh, remiss tonight if I didn't uh, mention uh, my gratitude to you for your leadership on this committee. Um, and I know there's still a vote that needs to happen, uh, but I have no doubt that our colleagues will recognize your skill as a legislature, uh, legislator and your decency as a person and will name you the next chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And uh, I, I got to tell you, we're going to miss the smell of c cigar smoke wa <laughs> wafting through the, this side of the Capitol building. But on second thought, uh, on second thought you're only going to be moving down the hall, so maybe we won't. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, but I can't think of any other person I would rather uh, chair the Rules Committee. Um, actually, I should rephrase that, because uh, there was, uh, I can think of one person, uh, me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that's going to take a change in the majority, and that's up to the American people, not to us. But I have to say, it has been an enormous privilege sharing this dais with you. Uh, it is clear that you have a tremendous respect for this institution, and you have always conducted yourself in a way that demonstrates that. And you have chaired this committee with decency and dignity and decorum. Uh, and it's not just in public when the cameras are rolling, uh, but you do it in private too. Uh, you're a man of integrity, a man of your word and you work hard to do the right thing even after the gavel comes down and the cameras are, are, are shut off. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I wish there were more Tom Coles in, in Congress uh, because I, I think you know the secret of legislating. And uh, it's a lesson I learned from my former boss and, and mentor, Joe Moakley, who's, uh, who served as chairman of this committee and whose portrait watches over us. And that is that you don't have to agree on everything to agree on something. Because the American people sent us up here to work out our differences uh, on their behalf and to do what's right for our country. And it's a skill that I've seen you deploy time and time again to bring people together and to try to find common ground. And even during moments of tense partisanship like presidential impeachments, uh, our committee has conducted itself in a way that has been lauded by journalists as, quote, a master class in civility. So although we don't always see eye to eye, I think that we've, uh, what we've done here is show the American people that it's possible to disagree without being disagreeable. And I, uh, I think that's worthwhile, and I think it matters, especially in this time of polarization and, pol and partisan anger. I'm also proud uh, of our work together to find ways to partner on areas of mutual concern, holding bipartisan hearings on issues like reforming uh, the War Powers Resolution, uh, seating a Cherokee Nation delegate in Congress, and addressing food insecurity in America. And on a more personal note, uh, Tom, I really hope I don't get you in trouble for this, but I, I want to tell you how much I value your friendship and respect your guidance and the example that you set around here. I have truly enjoyed working with you, even when we disagree, and in fact, especially when we disagree, because you conduct yourself in a thoughtful, decent, dignified ma manner, something I can't even always say of myself. Uh, so I, I am thankful uh, for the uh, staff that you have surrounded yourself with. I think they reflect positively on you. Uh, I think they are a credit to this institution, and I hope you don't take all of them with you. Um, <laughs> and I, um, I also saw the news that uh, uh, Mr. Burgess will be assuming the role as, as chair. I look forward to working with him. Uh, I've enjoyed a, uh, a good working relationship with him over the years, and I trust that he will follow in your example. So uh, I, just wa I just wanted you to know how much I and all of us on this side uh, appreciate uh, your example, uh, and uh, anyway, uh, you're not going. To, you're, you're still going to be here, but this will be your last ch uh, ch uh, time as chair of this committee. But just please know how much we all respect and love you. So thank you, thank you very much. Wow. Obviously, you have to reply to something like that. And uh, number one, um, thank you. I'm, and I mean this 
to everybody in this room uh, that uh, that's not just on the dais, but probably even more importantly, the staff on both sides of the aisle. I have appreciated working with each and every one of you, uh, really have. Uh, and I could sit here and single each and every one of you out. Uh, but uh, my colleagues have made sure my last meeting was one of my longest, so I won't, <laughs> won't uh, do that. But I will, uh, you know, there's, there's four of you I do have to single out. And I want to start with my friend, our distinguished ranking member, our former chairman. Uh, you know, uh, we've walked a long road together on this committee. Uh, we both started further down the dais. We both had the great honor uh, to uh, both chair the committee and serve as ranking member of the committee. I can't think of a more worthy adversary, and I can't think of a better friend than Jim McGovern. Uh, uh, and I, I share my colleagues' pride in this committee, uh, and I want to thank each and every one of you for the way in which you conduct yourselves uh, professionally and civilly. I mean, everybody up on this dais knows how to throw a punch, uh, but you always do it above the belt, and it's fair. Uh, and it's exactly what the American people expect us to do. Uh, and I want to thank the staff for how well they cooperate with one another back and forth. Um, but that example was set uh, with Jim McGovern's leadership. I mean, he led us through two impeachments. And uh, again, like you, I don't, uh, I don't think either of us found it a pleasant experience, but I was extraordinarily proud of this committee and proud of the way you conducted yourself and the members all conducted themselves. It was a serious thing. Uh, this uh, committee operated in a serious way, uh, and I think it does that each and every day. And again, you don't do that if you don't have the right kind of chairman, which we did when you chaired this committee, and the right kind of ranking member, which we do uh, while you're serving in that capacity. So uh, uh, I just uh, I so admire, so respect my friend. I can't uh, do anything other than join you in congratulating my good friend, uh, Dr. Burgess, uh, we came into Congress together. Uh, we came onto this committee 12 years ago when uh, our, our former colleague, former chairman, Chairman Sessions, decided it would cease to be an exclusive committee and we would bring expertise up here. Uh, and uh, there hadn't been a day in the 12 years we've been on this committee together that I ever had to wonder uh, how you would vote in the committee or on the floor, that I ever had to wonder how you would conduct yourself in the committee or on the floor. Uh, you had my back every step of the way. I can't think of a better person to have this gavel, my friend, uh, than you. And I know you and my friend, Mr. McGovern, will have a great working relationship. Um, I also uh, be remiss not to uh, not to talk about the staff. I'm going to focus on two uh, and Don Sisson's not here tonight, and I, I regret that. Uh, Don uh, was a good friend of mine when he was on this committee earlier. He became a better friend, honestly, when he worked in the Obama administration as a legislative uh, uh, liaison, and uh, I happened to be on his list. I can tell you he drank and smoked a lot more then uh, than he does now, although I can still lure him in for an occasional cigar even today, and he's probably about 50 pounds better off for the lifestyle decisions he made, but we don't have a better professional. Uh, and uh, he leads your side of the aisle, whether you're in the majority or in the minority, with incredible competence and decency. Uh, and, you know, when the lights do go off around here, we actually do get together and have a cigar and, and talk about the ways we can work together. I, I, I miss this, but I, I want to go back and reemphasize something you said, Chairman, uh, or Ranking Member. Uh, but uh, you like the first one better, I know. Uh, you know. Uh, but uh, we have found a lot of ways to work together. And uh, you taught me a lot about hunger, and we worked together, and you got the first White House conference on hunger since 1969, if I recall correctly. Uh, I think I taught you a little bit about Indians, and I appreciate that you were genuinely interested and helpful in that regard. And again, I, I share your pride in the work we've done. Uh, we probably had different opinions of the wars we were fighting, uh, but we didn't have any different opinion about how important it was to maintain the institutional integrity of the House, keep the war powers in the hands of the people. Uh, and uh, our work isn't done on that. We're going to keep working on that together. Um, the other person I got to single out is my staff director. Um, you know, I once in another context called her the pugnacious and tenacious Kelly Dixon. I think that was pretty damn accurate description. 
Uh, you know, uh, I've had the good fortune of knowing Kelly for many, many years in a variety of capacities. And I never thought we'd be able to get her to come to this committee, let alone that she would want to come. Uh, but uh, I think whether we were in the minority or now that we're fortunate enough to be in the majority, nobody's done more for the committee than, than Kelly. Uh, and honestly, I don't think anybody's done more for the institution because she is an institutionalist. I will say it kind of hurt my feelings when, when Steny Hoyer tried to hire her away from me, you know. And, uh, but I knew she wasn't going to go to the dark side. I just knew she was just nice. Uh, but, uh, again, um, I think those two staffers reflect the professionalism, the dedication, and the decency uh, of the, pe the people that over generations have uh, made this uh, committee work, I think, uh, so very, very well, made it a very special place in Congress. Uh, let me just uh, end with this. This is the last time I get to talk to you from this uh, side of the dais. Uh, I am very have very melancholy feelings uh, about that because, again, I have great affection for this committee. Uh, it was a committee I never asked to come to, quite frankly, but uh, over time became very honored to serve on. And I hope each of you know, particularly our newer members, what a special experience it is here because everything that matters is coming through here one way or the other. Uh, and you're probably collectively the best informed, uh, you know, members in Congress, and you also clearly have the confidence of your leadership or you wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, and, again, you respect uh, one another, and I think you guys represent your respective points of view, your respective constituencies, uh, and certainly your leadership and your party with great, uh, great professionalism. So I will miss this, but I won't be a stranger. Uh, to my friends in the press, I got three three things to say. Uh, number one, not a lot of press covers this place, but I appreciate the ones that do because I think they're very professional, uh, and I think we get a get a fair shake uh, in this. Uh, I will tell you, uh, I appreciate the courtesy. We have to go to your place to use the bathroom. Uh, I have never been stopped going to the bathroom. I've frequently been stopped coming out of the bathroom, but you never, ever stop me going in. And uh, I appreciate that uh, more than I can say. My one quibble would be uh, occasionally that, uh, hey, the Rules Committee isn't broken. We don't lose rules in the Rules Committee. We've had some problems on the floor. We've always gotten a rule out up here. Didn't matter if Democrats were, uh, were running it uh, or we were running it. And again, uh, that's the professionalism of, of the people here and uh, they know they've got to get their job done in order to get uh, the job done that uh, whoever the majority is at a given moment feels like it needs to get done on the floor. And, again, the, uh, to those in the minority, and I've been on both sides, uh, the arguments and the, uh, you know, the professionalism uh, and the criticism, quite frankly, push it to a better product. They, they genuinely do. Uh, and holding the majority to an account up here is a very worthy exercise. I'm very much a Lord Acton uh, Republican. I do believe that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, and this, the minority in this institution helps keep the majority honest, hold them to account, uh, and occasionally bloody their nose, uh, which needs to get done from time to time. So with that, again, thank all of you very, very much. Somehow I think there will be cigars until midnight tonight uh, in the room. Uh, there's an assortment of spirits. Uh, some of it's pretty damn expensive stuff, too. Uh, so uh, anybody that cares to come, uh, it's never required, but always encouraged uh, and welcome. So uh, with that, uh, I uh, adjourn this for the last time.